Last week, using 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as a guide, we took a close look at the subject of spiritual gifts. And you may recall that, that spiritual gifts can be defined as a supernatural ability that God bestows upon individual believers at the time of salvation. And essentially, these spiritual gifts are manifestations of the presence and power of God in our lives that help us to successfully perform our unique assignment in building the earthly kingdom of God. It's important for us to understand the difference between these gifts and natural abilities and talents. And to help us do that, I think we only have to look at the world of uh, entertainment or professional sports where we find many well-known, incredibly talented men and women. Sadly, a significant number of these individuals openly criticize or deny Jesus. And as a result, while they may have great talent, they do not have spiritual gifts because the Spirit is not present in their lives. So, when I ask you what your spiritual gift is, don't tell me that you can balance a car battery on your nose while you juggle two chainsaws and a toaster oven unless that is something you weren't able to do before you trusted Jesus and you plan on using those things to further the kingdom of God. Okay, we got that straight. Before we dive into today's scripture, I ask you to consider that understanding spiritual gifts is extremely important to us as we seek to live lives that are conducive to sharing the gospel of Jesus. Beyond simply knowing what our, our gifts might be, you know, we, we have to learn to balance those gifts with our personalities and our natural passions so that we don't unintentionally misuse our gifts in a way that harms others. Through the Spirit, God places His gifts within us, and then He uses them to bring glory to Himself. And from where I stand... It's nothing short of magnificent to see God working in this way through the people in our church. When I first studied scripture that, that says I have a natural, uh, supernatural spiritual gift, that entire concept seemed like a big mystery to me. And while I could see God working in mind-blowing ways through some of the other people I knew, calling these things spiritual gifts, it sounded intimidating. And I think that living in the Western world, uh, where we're taught from a very young age to logically process and challenge our own thoughts, continuously questioning everything as a means of learning. Consequently, I think that, that understanding our spiritual gifts becomes a greater challenge for us than it might be for believers living in, in some of the less developed places in the world. We read scriptures, and we hear testimonies of miracles and divine intervention and supernatural healing. But with human thought alone, I think these things seem suspect in our minds. And then we see these so-called spiritual gifts being used by people who are seeking fame and profit for themselves through such things as a, as a healing revival or by promoting what I call a pay-to-pray prosperity gospel. And with all that said, it's no wonder that even for those who solidly rest on the Word of God, that we come up with a wide range of conclusions concerning the validity and the importance of these spiritual gifts as it relates to our lives today. I think the important thing to recognize is that God is still in the business of miracles, healing, and other supernatural works. In fact, it would be foolish and unbiblical to claim that God does not heal people, that God does not speak to people, and that God does not perform miraculous signs and wonders. So a question that is often asked by believers is where any of the gifts of the Spirit, as described in 1 Corinthians, are still active and commonplace in the church today. Now to answer that question, we must first establish the fact that whether it be 2,000 years ago or this coming Friday, the Holy Spirit is free to dispense gifts according to his will. And I remind you that 1 Corinthians 12, 11, we looked at this last week. It says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. And then down in verse 11, it says, It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So far in my studies... 
Now, it may be there, but in my studies, I've yet to find anything that conclusively sets any time restraints on these scriptures. In the book of Acts, as well as as the other New Testament letters, the majority of post-Jesus miracles are performed by the apostles. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul provides us with some insight concerning the reason for that. He writes, when I was with you, I certainly gave you proof that I am an apostle, for I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. Now, while today's message is not a a sermon on apostleship, I think it helps when we understand the qualifications of a true New Testament apostle. First, an apostle of Jesus Christ is one who was an eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus. And you can see that in in 1 Corinthians 9.1 if you want to look at that. And then second, an apostle of Jesus was explicitly chosen by the Holy Spirit. And you can see that in Acts 9.15. And then third, an apostle of Jesus carried the authority of God to perform signs and wonders that reveal the power of God. And you can see that in in Acts 2.43 or 2 Corinthians 12.12. Shortly before his post-resurrection ascension to heaven, Jesus assigned the apostles the humanly impossible task of spreading his gospel to the four corners of the earth. And with that statement, I am finally vindicated because I've been trying to tell Dee Dee for years that despite what she has otherwise heard, the earth is flat. Essentially, the apostles bore responsibility for laying the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ, and 2,000 years later, that foundation is complete. So let's consider that if every believer in Philippi or Thessalonica or Corinth or Ellenwood, for that matter, were equipped with the ability to perform signs, wonders, and miracles, these undoubtable manifestations of the power of God would never be the exclusive identifying marks of an apostle of Jesus. Acts chapter 2 contains the text of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus. And as you know, the Bible says that 3,000 people were added to the church that day. And according to Acts 22, Peter preached this. He says, people of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus of Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. So in likeness to Jesus, the apostles were marked as genuine messengers from God by these gifts they exhibited and the miracles they performed. And I think it's important that we note that the early church did not have the complete Bible like we do today. Therefore, some of the gifts mentioned in last week's scripture, like the gift of prophecy, which is essentially spirit-led teaching, and tongues, that's the supernatural ability to speak other languages, were necessary in order for the early believers to see Paul and the other apostles as someone with the authority to speak for God. And perhaps it's the absence of, of those particular kinds of gifts among the everyday believers in Corinth that contributed to to some of the questions Paul had been asked from them concerning spiritual gifts. Again, we must understand that the gift of prophecy, miracles, and some of the other spiritual gifts Paul mentioned last week enabled the apostles to communicate new truth and revelation from God. Consequently, now that God's revelation is complete, perhaps, just perhaps, Some of the gifts we read about are no longer needed, at least not in in the same capacity as they were in the New Testament. I think the important thing to remember today is that God still miraculously heals people. God still speaks to people. And if he chooses, he can do these things. He can still perform miracles and signs through a believer. In any case, through this and other relevant scripture, we can be sure that God has given every one of us at least one spiritually enabled gift to be used in serving others. So, in a quick recap of our studies over the last 14 weeks, we've listened as Paul spoke into the divisions and an overall lack of unity within the church of Corinth that had given birth to these opposing factions all following a a different leader as a matter of personal preference. 
We've also read Paul's words as he explains the damage that can occur through spiritual pride and, and arrogance. And we've heard what he's had to say about some frivolous lawsuits among the believers. They were taking each other to civil courts in front of secular judges with no qualifications to judge anything on a spiritual basis. Paul has also addressed a specific instance of sexual immorality, and he's called for church discipline. He's given us instruction relating to sex, marriage, idolatry, and the proper use of our freedom in Christ. He's also provided reasons for following the cultural norms for proper dress, especially in worship, while explaining God's natural order of authority. Likewise, he has mixed no words regarding the abuse of the Lord's Supper, warning that its improper observance is inviting God's punishment. And then finally, last week, we looked at the purpose and correct use of spiritual gifts, likely indicating, we don't know that yet, we'll know that next week, but this likely indicates that there was some abuse or misuse of these gifts occurring within the church of Corinth. In each one of those areas of concern, Paul patiently, thoughtfully, and systematically addresses them one by one and answers specific questions he received in return from the believers, in return letters. He used everything that God has given him, his authority, his natural abilities of reasoning, his own spiritual gifts, and his keen God-given understanding of the gospel message, all under the umbrella of a deep Christ-like love for the Corinthian believers. And with all that said, I think you'll agree that this letter is far from a case of Paul simply picking up a pen, or I guess it was a feather back then, and hastily firing off some searing letter over the things he'd heard. And then again, in last week's scripture, Paul begins to address the intended purpose and proper use of spiritual gifts, finishing chapter 12 with a series of questions he hoped would guide the thoughts of the believers and help rechannel their respective gifts towards the intended purpose, which is benefiting others. And he simply asked the believers, are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? And then he quickly answers these questions for them, and he says, of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. And then in one final verse of chapter 12, an abrupt and remarkable change of tone occurs. Paul writes, but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. In the first eight verses of chapter 13, which we're going to look at this morning, Paul tells us about this way of life he's talking about. And beginning in verse 1, he writes, If I speak the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. We've just read one of the most loved passages in the Bible. And this scripture is frequently used in weddings and sometimes at funerals. And it's a chapter of the Bible that, that, you know, that seems to be relevant and applicable for generations of any point in time. And it also has appeal to people of all religious persuasion. Even for those who, who live their lives according to secular values and ideas of, of what makes a good person, this section of scripture kind of reads like a poetic description of utopia. But for those who study the Bible, we know this letter was written for the purpose of correction. 
And if we keep this chapter in true context, we know that it has nothing to do with celebrating a union between two people. Instead, Paul is still addressing the misuse of spiritual gifts. And in that, this scripture is intended to address a persistent human flaw in the core characteristics of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. To be a follower of Christ is to take this immovable stance on the values of godlike faith, hope, and love with love for others prevailing above everything else. In essence, this scripture addresses the integrity of the heart. Paul is telling us that, that for the believer, God's brand of love must be the driving factor that motivates any actions we take or the words we say. Because actions performed and words spoken without love are at minimum meaningless. And at their fullest potential, they can be extremely harmful to the body of Christ. So Paul begins this portion of his letter by showing us how pointless even the most impressive spiritual gifts are when they're used without love. And we're going to read those first three verses of chapter 3 again. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. These three verses center on four essential identifiers of a true believer in Jesus. Spiritual gifts, generosity, knowledge of God, and a faith that God can move the mountains in our lives. But again, Paul says that without love, these things are worthless. The specific Greek word he uses for love is agape, meaning basically a, a self-sacrificing and godly love. Now you and I can, can get together on Sunday morning and we can use our talents and abilities and, and praise Jesus. And we can pool our resources and, and serve others. And we can attend life group meetings and learn all about spiritual gifts and, and how to use them. And we can financially support noble causes and ministries Likewise, we can study the Bible together and go on a mission trip. But without love, these things are nothing more than spiritual noise. In fact, we can do most of these things without even loving God. Paul wants us to understand that we can do these things and still miss the core message of the gospel, which is pure and unrestrained agape love for others. If you think about it, some of the harshest words ever spoken by Jesus were directed at religious men who by the time they were 12 years old could recite the books of God's law from memory. And some of these men dedicated their entire lives to ensuring that others would obey the same law, which was a law that could not save them. Nonetheless, they believed in this law as they should. But they misunderstood the purpose and power of the law. And with that, more than belief in God, they believed in themselves and placed their trust in their own ability to please him. But these men didn't really love God, and they didn't really love people. They loved religion. Shortly before COVID set in and, and took my last job in the corporate world, I was in our break room one afternoon talking to a young man who had just been promoted to the team that I worked on, and in conversation, I mentioned that we weren't physically meeting and we're holding church services via live stream only. And in response to that, he said, oh, I didn't know you were religious. And I'm going to tell you the same thing I told him. I'm not religious. I'm trying to follow Jesus. But Paul wants us to know that there's a difference between religion and following Jesus. As a church, while we mean well, I, I think we tend, I'm guilty of this, we tend to jump straight into ministry plans and focus on working out the associated logistical challenge. And then once we sort all that out, we try to figure out how we can use whatever we came up with to love people through our efforts. But I think we all know that this needs to happen the other way around. Number one, we must love God. Number two, we must love people 
And it is only then we can effectively build the ministry of our church while we connect, equip, serve, and encourage one another all under the encompassing umbrella of agape love. Now, in effect, as we do the things on my list, connect, equip, serve, and encourage, we're practicing for the big game. So we must understand that we can't change the world we live in by simply flashing some God-given credentials around town or by inviting somebody to church. We can't change the world we live in with a list of spiritual gifts and faith and knowledge or anything else we possess, and we can't change the world we live in with a box of food or a package of diapers or by paying somebody's utility bill. We will only change the world when our words and actions clearly reveal the agape love of Jesus Christ. And as we work to find ways to show this kind of love within the boundaries of our new normal here at Ellen Wood Oaks Community Church, we don't have to be everything to everybody. We just have to be willing to love like Jesus. And once we meet that challenge, we can then choose the tangible ways that we'll use to show God's love to others. But with every step of every march we make, we must follow the flag of agape love. Last week, I said that if we stopped our study right now and read through the chapter, uh, all the chapters of 1 Corinthians that we've looked at so far in reverse order, we would find that every problem mentioned in Paul's letter was rooted in these original divisions and the lack of unity as described in chapter 1. You might recall that at the very beginning of his letter, Paul writes, I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Jesus Christ, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus, their Lord and ours. So, so we see right here that before addressing any of the concerns that was on his mind, Paul made it clear that despite the sin and strife that is occurring in Corinth, he is convinced that the faith of these believers is genuine. He acknowledges that they are God's holy people set aside for God's purposes. And through the scripture we've studied, you know, we have clear evidence that God was working in Corinth. We know that, that there was some structure in the church, that, that they had leaders and there were men holding positions. Uh, we know that they were meeting on a regular basis for worship and fellowship. And we know that there was a clear desire among the members to enjoy the spiritual freedom found in Christ. And we also know that, that each believer had received at least one spiritual gift. So one might wonder, beyond this division and overall lack of unity, what was the real source of the problems occurring among the members of the church of Corinth. And in Acts, I'm sorry, in, in chapter 13, Paul finally reveals the bottom line answer to this question. And the answer he gives is love. A Christ-like love for others was the one thing that was missing in the church of Corinth. Recently, my, my Tuesday Night Life group completed the last session of a study written by Pastor Chip Ingram titled Spiritual Simplicity. And while it's not a, a run through of 1 Corinthians, much of the scriptural basis for this study is found in the same chapter of 1 Corinthians where we find ourselves today. Consequently, uh, along with the work that I've been doing now for about three months, our life group study provided me with some additional insight for this morning's message. In the many weeks of my studies relating to this series, I have come to a much deeper understanding of the importance lovers, loving others plays in my role as pastor of Ellenwood Oaks Community Church. And I've really been looking forward to preaching this chapter for a very long time, but I was found that I was challenged this week by the task of narrowing down all the things that were rattling around in my head and merging them into a coherent message that would fit within the limits of the time we have today while adequately representing what I believe that God wants to say today. And to meet that challenge, I finally decided that I would do that by simply asking one relevant question concerning agape love and then do my best to answer that question. 
And the question I want to answer today is, is how does love respond to failure? That was one of the questions asked by Chip Ingram in one of the sessions of the Life Group study I mentioned a while ago. And I think that in the context of what we've learned concerning the Corinthian believers, this question is one that's worth looking at. Because after all, wasn't it a series of spiritual failures among the believers in Jesus that gave birth to those divisions in the church and threatened to destroy the unity in the body of Christ? Now, incidentally, I didn't quite succeed at narrowing down my message to a single question. However, I think you're going to be happy to know that you are going to make it home in time to watch 60 Minutes or America's Funniest Videos. God has given each of us legitimate desires for food, sex, security, significance, and fulfillment. And like the Corinthian believers, despite all we've been given through Jesus in our flesh alone, we're prone to go after those things in illegitimate and ungodly ways. Most often, the result of our misguided approach to finding fulfillment in our lives is something called failure. A failed marriage, a failed ministry, failure to, to keep our promises to God, failure to find any level of fulfillment or satisfaction through our blessings and the passions that we pursue in our lives. And in some cases, the fallout from these failures can lead us to a life that is marked by sin and addiction. And sometimes these failures can even take us to a place where we fail in our belief that the God who chose us over his own son truly loves us. The human failures in our lives hurt us. But much more than that, our failures hurt others. So simply said, in truth, try as we may, in the flesh nature of our earthly lives, we will be hurt and we will hurt others. So a fair question to ask ourselves this morning is, is what can we do about this? How do we respond when somebody hurts us? How do we respond when we realize that we've hurt somebody else? And beyond that, how do we best benefit the people in our lives? Paul says that when we find ourselves asking these kind of questions, the answer is always love. In the first sentence of verse, Paul, uh, verse 4, Paul declares, love is patient, love is kind. What does that look like? When love is patient, as we seek to forgive someone, love allows us to find peace as we wait for God to work in our life as well as the life of the one who hurt us. And if we want a mental picture of, of Paul's brand of patience, I, I think we could describe it as having a long fuse. In other words, not being in a hurry to blow something up. When love is kind, beyond politeness, love acts for the good of others. Even when it does not benefit us in any way, and even to the point where our kindness graduates to a degree of personal sacrifice. Now, Chip Ingram, who wrote the study I mentioned, compares Paul's brand of kindness to holding a pillow up to your chest to absorb the blow when you allow someone to slug you, and then you respond to that aggression by giving them a hug. Now, that all sounds well and good, but we all know that we're never going to be able to do that on our own. Therefore, we have no choice but to rely on the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Incidentally, I might add that Galatians 5, 23 through 24 identifies both patience and kindness as fruit of the Spirit. So we're not asked, nor can we expect, to be able to do this on our own. And in those times when one of us fails the other one, and we spiritually injure somebody else, we need to pray that the unity of the Spirit will provide all parties involved with this brand of patience and kindness. Back to the original question, how does love respond to failure? Essentially, today's scripture says that love responds to failure in five ways. Number one, love responds to failure with truth and grace. If you really think about it, failure demands both of those things. In the context of, of true agape love, truth without love is judgment. And grace without truth is just little more than empathy. 
Therefore, if we want to respond to somebody's failure with love, both truth and grace are necessary. Number two, love bears all things. Again, our scripture says that love is patient and that love is kind, and then it goes on to say it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrong. So simply said, love refuses to exploit the failures of others. Number three, love believes in all things. In other words, love believes in the best of others despite what we may humanly perceive as evidence to the contrary. So love is a product of faith that does not rest in a person. Rather, it's a faith in what God can do in a person's life. Number four, love hopes in all things. Verse six says that love always hopes. It says there is hope for this person that hurt me. And this hope is anchored not in the person, but in the promise of God's word. And then finally, number five, love endures all things. Verse seven says this about love. It says, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Amen. Verse eight concludes that love never fails. Consequently, true agape love is what gives us the power to stay in love with a person who has failed us. Now, ain't that an awesome message? If you're interested in going through the study that, that I've used to form my outline for this part of this morning's message, you know, let me know because I'd love to schedule that on an evening uh, during this fall. And I think that study is somewhere around seven sessions. I'm always amazed... When I look out over our church over the years and, and, and look at people I work with and all, but I'm amazed when I think of how God created a world with people of such incredible diversity and variety. And through Believer's Fellowship, some of the greatest blessings in my life have come through people that I may have otherwise never met or otherwise never taken the time to get to know on a personal level. And that, you know, that's certainly not because I think I'm better than they are. Rather, it's because through Jesus, we now have something in common. Within each of us, there are different preferences in colors and taste and sounds and music and food and scenery and, and pets and ideas and other things that offer us enjoyment. And that list of our differences is, is really unending. It goes on and on. But the bottom line says that we are different and no two of us are exactly alike. Yet through our connection with Adam to the God who created us, we all resemble the image of God. Therefore, despite our differences, we also have many things in common. We all have the capacity to think. Uh, we can reason. We can make decisions. We can worship. We can communicate. We can create and we can appreciate the beauty of an ocean or a sunset or the view from a mountaintop. And with that said, we also have similar limitations and needs. Because we all need food, we all need shelter, we all need clothing, we need to be loved, and we need to love others. Furthermore, all of us live within the same boundaries of a physical body and its capacity and our, our human knowledge our morality, uh, mortality, and many other common limitations. Still in God's great plan, like fine guitars and rare coins and luxury cars, we came to this world as a one-of-a-kind limited edition, which further increases our potential value to the kingdom of God. And you need to only look around our church this morning, and you can clearly see that we're all different. Yet, we're all equally valuable to God. And whether we appreciate it or not, I think we're also valuable to each other. In essence, I think I've just accidentally described the unity of the Spirit. But quite often, the purposes of our God-created commonality is cast into the shadows by the conflicts that arise through our God-designed differences. I'm going to say that again. The purposes of our God-created commonality is cast into the shadows by the conflicts that arise through our God-designed differences. 
And when we allow ourselves to remain under the control of our inherited flesh nature, we're cheered on by Satan who, uh, Satan who stands on the sidelines of our life waving these brightly colored pom-poms of temptation. Rah! And then he enthusiastically cheers for the natural self-serving desires that live within us that compete with the Spirit of God for dominance in our lives. And his goal is to take our, you know, these divine purposes of our differences and turn them into spiritual liabilities. Therefore, we need to remain ever aware that all of us have a big old bullseye on our back. Paul understands very well how our flesh nature typically responds to the differences between us. Through an exchange of letters, some of the believers had given eyewitness accounts to Paul of the carnage that had resulted through a flesh-driven approach to the God-created differences that exist between believers in Jesus. And I think all of us know that we won't ever find and maintain any unity through our flesh. Our unity at Ellen Woodhouse Community Church will only exist through the common spirit of God that lives in all of us. Consequently, before we leave today, we might ask one more question. How do we best hold the boat together as we navigate the choppy waters of our differences? And once again, Paul says that the answer is love. And I think the real question we want to answer today before we leave is how does love respond to those differences between us? And in essence, love chooses to celebrate our differences and refuses to compare them. The two most significant problems that were revealed in this scripture that are associated with our differences are envy and arrogance. And both envy and arrogance are the results of comparisons we make between ourselves and another person. And we can safely say that comparisons are always going to lead us to sin. In the case of envy, we compare ourselves to another person from the bottom side looking up. Look at Mark's new truck, y'all. Man, that is so nice. Envy says, my life, my car, my house, my job, and my dog stinks. And when we think like that, we're not really happy for Mark. We're sad for ourselves. We're jealous. You know, while I'm at it, y'all look at that. Y'all look at that head full of hair on Wayne's head. I barely have any hair left. Envy produces jealousy, anger, resentment, and bitterness. Now let's, let's look at arrogance. Arrogance is a comparison of, of the differences between ourselves and another person from a perceived high ground that we believe we're sitting on. Man, it must be a real bummer to be you. Arrogance produces pride, it produces boasting, rudeness, and independence. We think like, what on earth could this church possibly gain through somebody like you? So in a nutshell, envy brings one person to believe, I am better than you, while bringing the other person to the conclusion, well, I don't matter very much. And arrogance brings one to the conclusion that you don't matter very much. So both envy and arrogance present great danger to the body of Christ. The solution for both of these problems is to understand that God has sovereignly and widely given each of us what is best for us. And when it comes to our differences, we must remember that it was never about us to begin with. It's all about the kingdom of God, and it's all about the goodness of God. As I was writing my closing for this message, once again, I had some difficulty. And then I finally understood that God was not going to let me close this message today without answering three more questions. Where do you find love? How do you receive love? And how do you give love away? So where do we find love? 1 John 4, 7 through 8 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everybody who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. During our life group study, you know, I, I think in, in the context uh, of, of what we've looked at today, you know, we, we were just kind of blown away by some of this. The next question comes up, how do you receive love? 
Most of us, not all of us, but most of us receive some measure of love through our biological families. But anyone, anywhere, should be able to receive love through a spiritual family. Consequently, if you're looking for love, look no further than the body of Christ. And I pray that by example, I will always be able to lead a church that lives up to that statement. And our final question, how do you give love away? Jesus did a number of things to give love away, and these things are things we can do, and they should feel very normal for us here at Ellen Oaks Community Church. He taught with people. He walked with people. He shared a meal with people. He prayed with people. He suffered with people. And when necessary, he forgave people. And in the final verse of chapter 13, Paul wants us to know that long after our spiritual gifts are of any use to us, when our earthly days are over and our knowledge is complete, when we see all there is to see with perfect clarity, only three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these things is love. And with all that said, as we close our service today, I want to simply encourage you to connect, equip, serve, and encourage one another. And on your way out, tell somebody that you love them. We'll see you all next week.